Good morning. I'm Amy. On a regular day, I'm a recreation therapist. I work with Aurora Healthcare, but today is not a regular day. I'm honored to be volunteering here at the symposium for the day. And my role now, uh, my esteemed role, is to introduce our speaker for a balanced approach to emotional well being. Sarah Zingzyme is a licensed professional counselor and a certified dialectical behavior therapist. Sarah has dedicated this past decade to her work in the private clinical setting as a professional mental health counselor. Sarah is trained in DBT and specializes in working with adults who have experienced complex childhood trauma. Utilizing the skills and understandings from DBT, she helps her clients find both acceptance for everything that has led up to the present moment while also working on changes important to capture a life worth living. Now I am pleased to present Sarah Zingzyme. And I'm not sure if I'm going to stand up there. I'm more comfortable down here. Is that all right with everyone? Awesome. I already love you guys. <laughs> um, so if you did not get a yellow ticket, raise your hand. Oh, Lori. Lori. At, at the very end, I'm going to pull one magic ticket who is going to get to walk away with this amazing book full of tools and strategies. Uh, it was actually written by a friend of mine, Holly Schneider. And it's her memoir, and it's she's a therapist, and it's full of amazing strategies and tools. So I'm going to just give this at, away at the very end. So don't leave until we uh, name off that ticket number. So she'll come around slowly as I'm getting started. And also, if you did not get a little bag with three little pearls, raise your hand. Those yeah, are coming around. Started. She yeah. just started. So just, yeah, just go like this. I need pearls. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to get started while my Amazing helpers are helping me out here. Um, so I'm certified as a dialectical behavioral therapist. And most people, when, they've, when they hear DBT, they have no idea what that is. The, the, the one that stands out is the D, dialectical behavioral therapy. Dialectics is really the understanding that opposites are integrated and that they exist all around us all the time. And sometimes we fight that. Sometimes we get out of balance with that understanding. So DBT looks at in a, a balanced approach of emotions, a balanced approach when in distress, a balanced approach with our feelings about ourself and with our relationships with other people. And dialectics is the understanding that there's so many opposites that are actually both true at the same time and existing at the same time. And when we fight that, that is when we become challenged to maintain emotional and physical well-being. And so I thought it was important that we talk about that and focus on that today in, in our breakout today. So we're going to look at a couple opposites that I actually look at with my clients at the clinic where I work every day. And it's my cheat sheet. I'll glance on it from time to time. Forgive me. Um, so the first um, opposites I really want to look at is our emotional part of who we are and truth and logic. So if you think about this is how I feel, sometimes we can go down a rabbit hole, right? A lot of times that rabbit hole is called anxiety or fear or depression or anger or discouragement. And if we have that emotional part of who we are in balance with also what we know, truth, logic, facts, if we can balance those two, then we have a better chance to move forward with a balanced, successful path ahead of us. And the importance to keep in mind is the fulcrum which is why I kind of made on your handout. Raise your hand if you did not get a handout. Everybody should have one. Okay. Lori, could you get handouts? Yeah. 
um, I kind of created like a scale because I use that not only in describing dialectics with my clients, but I actually have that visual in my own head when I'm struggling with something and I feel really emotion-minded, I remind myself of balancing that with truth, with logic. And the fulcrum has to be and. Because if your fulcrum is but, you're gonna invalidate the first part. So I'll give an example. This is how I'm feeling and this is what I know. If you have that approach, then you're going to be able to move toward resolution, solution, and sometimes acceptance, depending on what the event is. If our, if our two connecting, if our fulcrum, if our connector is but, all bets are off. I know how I'm feeling, but I don't like the truth I'm being told. Or, this is the truth, but I'm really struggling with all of this emotionally. Change out the buts, get rid of your butt, just get rid of your butt, and change it out with and. This is what I know, and this is how I feel. The and allows space for both to exist together, to be balanced together, and that's really important. In fact, the core dialectics in DBT, where we start in therapy, is the balance of two big things. Most people come into therapy really set on change. They'll come in and they'll say, oh, I, I wanna do this different, I really wanna change this, and don't get me started on the changes my husband needs to make. So they have all these changes, and they're, they're all ready for that. And then I'll start to question, well, where are you with who you are? How you accept the person you are to this day and the things that have happened to you or the things that you believe and the feelings you have about yourself. And that gets really uncomfortable sometimes with clients. It gets kind of ugly. They don't like talking about that. And in fact, our self-critic likes to kind of remind us, I really don't accept who I am. I really don't accept what's happened to me in my life. And if that piece is a deficit, then making any changes consistently is going to be really, really difficult. And here's why. And I use this example with my clients all the time. If I want to go to the gym and lose some weight, and that's the change I want to make, and of course it's New Year's Day, so I have this resolution, I'm going to start going to the gym, I'm going to make this change for myself, and maybe I've got one or two great days, I get up early, get my gym clothes on, and get to the gym. Great, I'm moving towards that change. But then one morning, I don't wanna get out of bed, it's cold. I've got a big day ahead at work. And then those thoughts start seeping in. See, there it is, I can't do anything right. Of course, why did I ever think I could do this anyway? those self-doubt, self-loathing, self-critic messages start creeping in. And if we really practice working on self-acceptance, like I'm doing the best I can, and a part of that is grace, patience with ourselves, and kindness with ourselves. If we can work on the acceptance part and balance that then with change, that will look more like I accept who I am at this moment that I did everything I could with the knowledge and understandings and tools and the people that were supporting me up until this very moment. And these are the things I think I can change to be better. Buckle up, now you're gonna start seeing some changes. And when you have those moments of failure, you can practice more self-kindness and more self-understanding. And remind yourself, I've worked on acceptance. I'm okay with who I am. I'm not perfect. Okay? Now, I have to go to my cheat sheet. All right. So, why is balance so important? Because balance really is kind of the theme. There's one major 
system in all of us. And when it's balanced, we are smooth running machines. And it's called our autonomic nervous system. Raise your hand if you're familiar with your autonomic nervous system. Yeah, a handful of you in a room of 200. Now raise your hand if you've ever heard of fight or flight. Ah, okay. So you know half the system. The autonomic nervous system starts at our brain stem, runs down our spinal cord and into all of our body systems. Kind of important, right? So there's two sides, and when those two sides of the autonomic nervous system is in balance, we will be okay. That doesn't mean everything's gonna be amazing and perfect, we will have challenges. But if we can manage keeping our autonomic nervous system in balance, we will be able to face every adversity as it comes along. So let's look at those two sides of the autonomics. Let's look at the one that you all raised your hands you already heard about, and that is the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, and it's two parts, the autonomic. Autonomic nervous system is the entire system. Sympathetic is one side. The sympathetic side is wired for survival. Hence, fight or flight. Bear jumps out of the woods. Sympathetic nervous system kicks into place. I would recommend not fighting the bear, but maybe running, flight, right? So what's actually happening to us physiologically is we're getting a whole host of hormones and chemicals coursing through our body. The two we've most heard of is adrenaline and cortisol. Cortisol created in our, our adrenal glands, up our kidneys, and that allows us to survive. It's built in us to survive. And then our system goes back to calm. Our core should be calm. Our default should be calm. And when the bear jumps out of the woods, and for some of us, the bear is sitting in a doctor's office waiting for what the diagnosis is gonna be, and the fight or flight is activated. Fear activates fight or flight, right? Perceived threat to my health, perceived threat to my well-being. When that activates, fight or flight activates, that's the bear. And now we've suddenly got our bloodstream filled with cortisol it's coursing through our system. And as soon as we find something that can bring us calm, we go back to our default of calm. The problem with the sympathetic nervous system that side, the fight or flight, wired for survival. It's, it's not a bad, the bad guy. We need it. Sometimes we need to run from the bear. The problem is it tends to monopolize us because a lot of emotions activate cortisol production. And when that happens, the autonomic nervous system, which should be in balance, falls out of balance. And the other side of the autonomics, the parasympathetic system, becomes paralyzed. It shuts down. And so when the sympathetic nervous system is constantly being triggered by uncomfortable emotions, and I'll give you the big hitters, anger is number one, fear, frustration, overwhelm, panic, anxiety, irritation, all those icky, uncomfortable emotions we feel, we are creating cortisol production. And it's throwing our autonomics out of balance. And so it's our work to restore the calm, finding a solution, maybe balancing, this is how I feel with, with, with this is what I know, to move through this particular difficult conflict I'm in. But if that is chronic, and monopolizes our autonomics, the parasympathetic system starts to shut down. So now let's come over and look at the other side, parasympathetic nervous system. So if the sympathetic's called fight or flight, the parasympathetic is called rest and digest, layman's terms, because those are two of the biggest systems that it manages. So the enzymes, the acids in our stomach, it manages digestive system. Sleep, it manages melatonin. 
magnesium levels. The parasympathetic side is also wired for survival. We need to sleep to survive. We need to eat to survive. It also manages sex. We need to procreate to survive. So when these two systems are in balance, we are good. But when we have too much chronic anxiety that's not being managed, or, in, or fear, or anger, or depressed mood, the parasympathetic side can't compete with that. It falls out of balance, and now our parasympathetic side is compromised, shuts down. And here's the big red flags, sleep issues, I can't fall asleep, I can't stay asleep. Appetite issues, I'm not hungry anymore. In fact, I feel kind of nauseous when I think about eating or I can't stop eating. I'm like comfort eating all the time. And other red flags of the parasympathetic not functioning, which is a big red flag, light on your dashboard, your autonomics are out of balance, is other things the parasympathetic manages, like love, attraction, wanting to engage with the world, do joyful activities that I used to enjoy. Suddenly all those feelings kind of dissipate. Those are red flags. The autonomics are out of balance. And why is this important that we're talking about it today? Let's talk about how we can lower our cortisol levels, things we can do for just about zero dollars, and I'm not talking about any medications you need to take to get your autonomic nervous system back in balance so that the anxieties you feel in your everyday life, no matter your situation, whether it's chronic illness, relationship issues, whatever it is, so that you're better able to face all of that adversity every day if your autonomics are in balance. So what can we do to get that parasympathetic more activated? Well, let's write some of them down. I think, is that in the handout, a little area where we can do that? All right. I'm gonna start with some easy ones. Get outside if you're able to. Vitamin D, green space, get outside. We know physical exercise as much as you're able to do. That gives you a great burst of wonderful chemicals that will offset cortisol production, like oxytocin, dopamine, endorphins. So increased cardiac activity, physical exercise, time with people we love, surrounding yourself with people that support you. Those are all very important things that can help you maintain balance with your autonomic nervous system. Raise your hand if you engage in yoga or Tai Chi. Right, those, those hands raised, those are right things to do. That will also increase balance in your autonomics. I like to think of yoga as like meditation, like with movement, like meditation with your body. So meditation, yoga, both good things to engage in. Breathing. We can all do it. We're all here right now. Breathing is the ultimate reminder of balance. When we inhale, we're actually activating our sympathetic nervous system. When we exhale, we're actually activating our parasympathetic nervous system. So the balance of inhale, exhale, that in and of itself can help restore balance. You might have noticed, you don't have to raise your hand, I've noticed when I've had an increased anxiety in my life that suddenly it's like hard to take a full breath, like shallow breathing. Focused breathing, deep breathing, will help you get that balance back with the parasympathetic. And here's the key. The exhale has to be longer because you want to promote the parasympathetic. So let's try the 478 breathing. It's tried and true. It's free. You can do it any time of the day, morning, noon, or night. 
So I'm going to explain it first, and then we're just going to try it together. So the idea is we're going to breathe into the count of four, and I'll do that, through our nose. Then we're going to hold our breath for the count of seven. And then we're going to breathe out through our mouth. You can make a little sound for the count of eight. Notice that the eight, the exhale is longer than that inhale. We have to activate the parasympathetic. We have to breathe in to breathe out. But let's make that out breath longer. Let's push out those toxins. Let's get some balance. So let's try it right now, and I'll guide you through it. So I'm going to have you count. Uh, I'm going to have you breathe into the count of four through your nose. One, two, three, four. Hold it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's four, seven, eight breathing. I remember when I first started that, when I was really struggling with anxiety in my life, that felt like hell. It was really difficult for me to do that full breath in and that longer breath out. That was uncomfortable for me. And if you felt that just now, stick with it. It's like anything we do, right? The more we do it, the easier it becomes, right? And that's always available to help you find that balance. Balance is so important in taking care of ourselves, especially with any kind of a chronic illness that we're trying to manage effectively. All right. If you want an app, because I know I like to be accountable. I know I will forget to do it if it's left up to me. If you want an app idea that can help you with your breath, with guided meditation, guided relax, like muscle relaxation, if you haven't heard of any of these three apps, write them down now. If you already have them, good job. Uh, the first two you've probably heard of, they're pretty um, marketed. The first one is Headspace, it's one word, Headspace. And the next one is called Calm. The name itself just conjures well-being. And the last one is lesser known, but it's all about the breath. And it's called Breath Work. One word, but no R in work. So it's the word breath, W-R-K. I don't know why they left the O out. But those three apps can help encourage the balance of your autonomic nervous system. A lot of doctors don't talk about the autonomics, and it's so important. I once was at a chiropractor's office, and I saw this spinal cord poster. I don't know if any of you have seen that in a chiropractor's office. And it kind of talked about how every, like, every part of the vertebrae kind of went into impact different body systems. The autonomic nervous system. When it's out of balance, there's some really uncomfortable red flags, like migraines, restless leg syndrome. I had it this morning. Actually, after my keynote, I sat down and said to Lori, oh, my legs are bothering me. And there's a whole host of other red flags when your autonomics are out of balance. So I really recommend paying attention to making sure that the parasympathetic is given the same stage as the sympathetic. And when you feel the uncomfortable emotions that create the cortisol from anger, stress, frustration, sadness, fear, overwhelm, panic, think about what can I do right now to move through this emotion. Don't push the emotion away. I'm going to feel the feeling, figure out what's creating that feeling, and I'm going to think about, this is how I'm feeling, and this is what I know. I can call my friend or go to my spouse for some support. Or I can get outside and give my brain a break and take a short walk to get the mail. That's why those two in balance are so helpful. Because when we get that burst of cortisol, I wouldn't recommend staying there. I'd recommend reminding yourself of that scale. This is how I'm feeling right now. It's not comfortable. And this is what I know. These are some things I can do. 
I'm going to do a four, seven, eight breath. Or maybe listen to a guided meditation on the app I downloaded off App Store. Or maybe call a friend and see if she wants to go for maybe coffee this afternoon. Because that's you in charge of keeping those two things in balance, which will help you every day in your relationships, in your emotion regulation, in moments of distress. So if we look at how to be present, we have to be present in order to be successful, right? If our brain's way out there, thinking about all the, th the things we have to do, all the worries, maybe we're waiting for a doctor call, maybe we've got an issue with someone in the family and we don't know what's happening, or if our thoughts are back there behind us, things that have already happened that weren't easy, we're gonna be less effective with what we can actually control right now in the present. And so to be balanced, we have to have our starting place at being mindful, being present. And so I, I actually am going to read it, and it's on your handout. The, the dictionary definition, actually from John Kabat-Zinn, who is like the guru of mindfulness behavior, mindfulness practice, paying attention on purpose in the present moment. This is the one everyone struggles with without judgment, ick, like that's self-critic. And in the service of self-understanding, what do I know, what do I understand right now that I can control, that I can change, and sometimes, and these are sometimes the most difficult moments, what are the things I just have to accept right now? So that's mindfulness. Where am I in time? I think I have enough. Okay. So if you got your little pearl bag, raise your hand if you never got that little pearl bag. Oh, we have a couple. Okay. She's coming around. <laughs> My daughter Rachel and I put these together. She'd be very upset if we didn't use them because it was an entire All right, one up here. So I, I was actually introduced to a documentary uh, by my son about two months ago. He came across it on Netflix and he came upstairs from the basement where he was watching. He's like, oh my gosh, mom, this is the best documentary ever and your clients are gonna love it. Eh, we'll see about that. He's 18. So I went downstairs with him and we watched this documentary. Raise your hand if you've ever seen the documentary Stutz. Stutz, S-T-U-T-Z. Oh, a couple of you. Two out of 200. Write it down, everyone. S-T-U-T-Z, Stutz. It's a documentary on Netflix. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the actor Jonah Hill. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm 51 years old. I'm not a fan of Jonah. I don't watch the movies he makes. He's not, my, he's not in a lot of rom-coms, I'm sorry. It's kind of like a guy flick kind of a thing. And then I saw Stutz and now I love him. My whole perspective of Jonah has changed and in that little side note taught me that first impressions, you have to be careful. Can't make those judgment calls. So Jonah had, and I'm not going to give away the whole documentary because I want you all to watch it, but Jonah decided to make this documentary a couple years ago. It's actually streaming on Netflix. He made it because he had gone through a pretty significant trauma in his family. And he'd been to a number of therapists in his life, but when he met Phil Stutz, everything shifted for him. It was a game changer. So Phil Stutz 
really got him through this adversity he and his family was going through. Now Stutz, interestingly, has Parkinson's disease. And so as, this, as the documentary unfolds, you see not only what Jonah and his story is, you also see what the therapist, Phil, and his story is and the adversity he experienced that got him to the point where he wanted to help others. So in, Phil's, in the Stutz documentary, it's filled with strategies and tools that Stutz shared with Jonah in order for him to be able to move forward from the trauma he'd experienced. And so in this documentary, and I recommend having a notebook when you watch it, I watched it this, the first time with my son, skeptically. Then I went back, started over, and watched it again with a notebook because it's so full of wisdom and tools. In fact, they came out with a book called Tools after that documentary. So I wanted to talk about one of the strategies that Stutz talks about with Jonah in the movie. And it has helped Stutz himself get out of bed every day, face all of the things, all of the tasks that he has to complete every day with Parkinson's, which he was diagnosed with at a very young age. So the, the strategy is called string of pearls. And so you all have that little bag. You don't have to put the pearls on the string. It's more of a reminder of the strategy itself. But Stutz said to Jonah, if you look at every day and every task as a pearl, and your job is to put the pearl on the string, keep in mind that there is not one pearl that is more or less valuable than the next. The idea is just to put the next pearl in the string. So if you got out of bed, and for some of us, that's a big pearl, right? You put the pearl on the string, brushed your teeth, pearl on the string. Went to your doctor's appointment, it's another pearl on the string. And he said the point isn't about the pearl. The point is you're putting the next pearl on the string. The point is you're moving forward. It's not about the pearl. And everything we do every day, if we're mindful, if we're present, if we're thinking about what is it that I can control right now, what is it I can do next, you put the pearl on the string. And don't worry about the pearls out there. And don't worry about the ones that are already on the string. You know, I really like to think, I tell my clients, I really like to think we're all just big dot-to-dot -dot pictures. Like, none of us really know what our final picture is going to be. We just have to focus on today's dot, right? And today's dot's attached to yesterday's dots and all the other yesterdays. But we can't go too far out there. We don't know how all those dots out there are going to attach to today's dot. It kind of reminds me of String of Pearls. Don't worry about the pearls 12, 12 in on your string. Focus on the next pearl. What can I control now? What can I change now? What's next? That's what's important to move forward. So I believe also on our handout is a couple definitions. And these are really lenses through which to see our world, right? Raise your hand if you've heard of fixed mindset. A couple of you. Yeah, so fixed mindset is a lens through which we see our world. And I'm just going to read it, and it's on your handout. Fixed mindset is the belief that a person's capacities, abilities, and life situation cannot change. Fixed mindset. And we can have a fixed mindset with our physical well-being, our health, 
We can have a fixed mindset in relationships with other people, in our situation maybe at work, in our situation maybe in our marriage. It's not going to change. It's not going to be better. This is what it is. I can tell you it doesn't conjure the most comfortable emotions. You might even activate a little sympathetic nervous system activity. Fixed mindset is not the lens through which to see the world if you want to live your best life. What I'd recommend is a lens called growth mindset. Raise your hand if you've heard of growth mindset. It's a bit of a, more of a buzzword. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to read that one. Growth mindset is the belief that a person's capacities, abilities, and life situation can be improved over time with effort, strategies, and support from others. So I hear, when, when, whenever I look at the growth mindset definition, when I hear effort, I think stress. Because when you look at what stress is, stress is energy and effort, right? If I'm engaged in my world, if I'm going to work, energy, effort. Sometimes getting out of bed, energy and effort, stress. Growth mindset doesn't mean you're not going to have stress. Growth mindset means you're going to meet that stress in a way that's going to move you through it because you're looking at the challenges in your life as opportunities to figure out, how can I approach this? What attitude can I have? How can I do things differently? And a and a fixed mindset doesn't allow for that. And a fixed mindset will continue to cultivate a lot of uncomfortable emotions, like misery, frustration, bitterness, anger. And those won't help us, and it certainly won't help our physical, because don't lose sight of the fact that our physical and our emotional parts of who we are are one machine. They profoundly influence one another when I have clients come in with major depressive disorder or anxiety disorder or panic disorder, there is not a one of them that have a clean bill of health physically. They are also on a list of medical prescription medications with a whole host of medical diagnoses. They profoundly influence one another. So the growth mindset lens is looking at what is in front of me? And how can I approach it as an opportunity to figure out, how can I get through this? What am I going to do? How can I balance this is how I feel with this is what I know right now? People with a growth mindset see challenges as opportunities to adapt, learn, and grow, rather than as limitations or impossibilities. It's like a cup half full, right? Cup's half full. I don't have the full glass of water. I got half of it. It's kind of like that mentality, right? And so now if you add gratitude to growth mindset, think about how everything even goes up another level. Gratitude is like such a buzzword in the last 20 years. Gratitude journals, have an attitude of gratitude. Gratitude, I would say, is one of the most under, what's the word? It's really not recognized as the powerful thing it actually is. Gratitude, thankfulness for what we have, thankfulness for even being here, the chemicals, the hormones that our body can create from gratitude will balance those autonomics, lower that cortisol. You're going in the other direction now. So if you add gratitude to a growth mindset, buckle up. Your life is going to go in directions that you're going to enjoy, that you're going to feel fulfillment 
maybe for the first time consistently. So really work on gratitude and growth mindset. And I wanted to um, end today, and I know I've got a little bit of time, so we can probably, yeah, in one minute. Um, I first, before we're going to play a little video, I just wanted to tell you about um, my nephew, Eli. So obviously none of y'all know him. Um, but when he was a little kid, I've got eight nieces and nephews. He kind of stood out because he was that kid, if I'd go up to him and say, hey, how are you doing, Eli? He'd be like, great, Auntie Sarah. How are you doing? What eight-year-old does that? Like, all the rest of them, he'd be like, hey, Aaron, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. All right. Eli was a little different. Eli was a kid that could kind of talk to people of any age. Not always, but more than the other kids in our family. I noticed him spending more time talking to grandpa, wanting to learn how to play chess, than the other kids who just wanted to be back in the backyard playing. So Eli was always just a little different. And I appreciated about him from the time he was a kid, his acceptance, his optimism, his willingness to engage. And then in July of 2021, it was actually the night the Bucks won the Bucks championship, he was downtown by Deer District with a, with a buddy and um, had an accident. And I actually have uh, video that were that will tell the story um, but what's interesting is that a couple weeks had gone by he was at freighter his life was kind of hanging in the balance our emotional well-being was hanging in the balance and after the intubation was out after he healed from the tracheotomy surgery after he was weaned off the ventilator for a number of weeks, every, every few days, a little bit more off the ventilator, and after he could finally talk, we were all really curious what he might say. Because he didn't have a brain injury. He had a body injury. So we could only imagine what his first words might be once they got that trait thing hooked up so that he could actually say words we could actually understand. So my sister Carrie was in the room at Freighter with him and a couple nurses when he had the opportunity to first talk. And it was really a game changer for all of us. And what it helped me understand is that when we have that lens, it's hard to lose it when we see its value. So I really encourage all of you to really think about balancing what I know and how I feel. What I can accept about who I am with the changes I want to make to be better. And do it with that lens of growth mindset. And add gratitude because it's amazing how you can face some of life's biggest adversity and come through on the other side. So it's amazing about Eli is when he fell, he was in a parking garage uh, watching the Deer District with a couple friends and they found um, a bike somebody had left in the garage. And um, he fell off the bike and jumped up on a middle ledge on the second floor and said to his buddy, I don't feel good. And then he passed out and fell backwards. And he's still completely paralyzed. And he's the most amazing positive kid you'd ever meet. And it was interesting, and I don't know that I've ever told him that, but I know a lot of us feel it that know Eli, is that his falling helped us rise, helped us really recognize this life we have and to make the most of it, no matter the adversity. So I give that to all of you today as you continue into your next presentations throughout the day.
think about what can you learn from these different presenters, from these different vendors? What can you take with you today to build on what you have so that you can live that life worth living with Parkinson's? Thank you, everyone.